One early morning, Gordon awoke with a start. He felt strange, but could not explain why. His driver, who had come to clean him before work began, reassured him. It's the ditch water, he said to Gordon. It can get into your mechanical workings and make you feel sick. Gordon was satisfied with that explanation, but what was odd was that he couldn't remember falling into the ditch, even though it had recently happened. The memory was fuzzy at best. I'm just exhausted from pulling the express so well, <laughs> he chuckled to himself and fell back into an uneasy sleep. He dreamt of vague images, those of a mine and of darkness below. In these images, he felt apart from himself, as if viewing the events from above. He couldn't see anything clearly, but he felt strongly that these memories didn't belong to him. Later that morning, Gordon sleepily brought his train to the junction. Thomas, who looked equally tired, greeted him with a smile. Long night? Thomas asked. Yes, I had some very strange dreams, Gordon replied. Me too. It was like we were back at the mine again, but when I awoke, I couldn't actually remember being there at all. Gordon's eyes widened. I had the same dreams. Come to think of it, I can't remember falling into the ditch, much less rescuing you from the mine. What does it mean? Thomas asked. I don't know. We only just came back. I remember bringing you to the yard, just before the Queen came to the island. I remember that too. But why can't we remember actually being at the mine? The two engines decided to find out for themselves. That night, the two of them puffed up the line which led from the big station. They rounded the bend that led to the mines, but were met with cautionary signs that read, Danger! Collapsed mine ahead! We'll have to investigate from here, said their crews. They walked past the signs and towards the collapsed mine shafts. They came back a short while later. What are you doing back so soon? Thomas asked. Uh, nothing to see. Let's head back. Thomas and Gordon didn't believe them. You didn't even take a light with you! How could you have seen anything? Their crews insisted, but Thomas resisted. He sped through the cautionary signs and stopped to the edge of a large, gaping pit. When he looked down inside, he shrieked. G -g -g Gordon! Thomas called, tears welling in his eyes. Gordon puffed up next to Thomas, and he too shrieked in horror when he saw what was inside the pit. In the pit were two mangled engines. But that wasn't the worst part to Thomas and Gordon. The worst part was that these two mangled engines looked exactly like them. Who, who are those engines? Gordon asked. A terrible feeling began stewing deep in his boiler. Suddenly, a light turned on next to Thomas and Gordon. They shut their eyes, blinded by the light, before a voice spoke. I can explain. Thomas and Gordon slowly opened their eyes to see the fat controller standing next to his car with a light in his hand. Sir, asked Thomas, what are you doing here? Your crews told me to come here, explained the fat controller. They know the truth, and now so shall you too. I had hoped that this day would never come, he continued, but alas, here we are. The Fat Controller walked over to the pit before speaking again. These here, he continued solemnly, were you. W what do you mean, were? asked Thomas, distress in his voice. When you fell into the mine, Thomas, explained the Fat Controller, you didn't just fall. The mine collapsed beneath you, swallowing you whole. We tried bringing Gordon, our strongest engine, to lift you out with a pulling system, but unfortunately, we all misjudged how hollow the shaft was below, as well as how weak the ground was below, so he too fell into the growing chasm beneath the ground. To make matters worse, the extra collapsed ground caused some trucks to roll backwards into the mine, crashing into you two, which set you two on fire. The fire brigade was called, but by then it was already too late. Your bodies were completely mangled. But 
How can we be here if we're down there? Gordon asked. It's a gruesome tale, sighed the fat controller. We had a major scandal due to our lack of judgment, and to save face, we saved your faces. There was a talented engineer from crew who moved your identities into new shells. The engines you see below, your former selves, were prototypes. Thomas and Gordon didn't know what to say. In their confusion, they began to cry. That doesn't change who you are now, the Fat Controller said. You're still two of my most useful engines. We gave you a second chance. And avoided a scandal. We understand, Thomas said in a derisive tone. Soon after, the two engines slunk home, buffer to buffer. Everything felt familiar and foreign at the same time. They didn't feel whole anymore, knowing that a part of them was rotting away in the bowels of the mines. They only hoped that one day, many years from now, these memories would become fuzzy too. Thomas and Gordon tried their best to recover from what they learned at the old mines, but try as they might, it kept coming back. The other engines didn't know what was the matter, because the two engines didn't dare tell them. Either they wouldn't be believed, or they feared the other engines would never look at them the same way again. Thomas and Gordon often slept at the junction. The two comforted each other. How are you managing? Gordon asked. Not very well, replied Thomas. I was late twice today. My crew understood, but the passengers were cross. I can't get these thoughts of that night out of my head, Gordon. I know, Thomas, I know. Neither can I, said Gordon softly. This isn't going to go away for a long time, but no matter what happens, I'll always be by your side. You promise, Gordon? asked Thomas. I promise. The two smiled before they slowly dozed into a deep sleep. That night, Thomas had a dream. He dreamt that he was puffing down an old but familiar line. By the time he reached the end of the line, he froze in horror. Oh no, not here, he cried. Slowly, against his will, Thomas moved closer and closer to the giant chasm. Thomas had his eyes shut tight. He didn't want to look, but after a while, Thomas opened one of his eyes. He cautiously looked down. He gasped in shock. The hole in the ground was completely empty. The rusted shells that he saw that night were gone. Suddenly, Thomas felt a bump from behind. Help! Thomas woke up in alarm, shaking all over. A yawning could be heard. Thomas, what's wrong? Are you all right? asked Gordon. Thomas didn't say anything. He couldn't speak. He puffed out of the shed leaving behind a worried Gordon. Thomas was a wreck throughout the day. He was constantly late with his trains and couldn't concentrate. All the time, he kept thinking about his dream, the shells and what really happened. It's all my fault, he said to himself. I caused this. I foolishly went past that sign and now I've put not only myself through this torment, but Gordon as well. <laughs> Eventually, Thomas was ordered to be placed in the sheds until further notice. Percy and Toby took it in turns to look after Thomas's work. The two engines were worried for their friend. Night had fallen at the junction. Thomas was dozing when suddenly he heard something. It was faint at first, but eventually the sound grew louder. The sound of rusty wheels. It creaked and groaned as it grew louder and louder. What was odd was that Thomas couldn't hear the sound of an engine, no puffing. This only made Thomas feel sick in the boiler. When he heard a whistle, it was distorted and wonky. But that wasn't the worst part. Thomas knew who the whistle belonged to. At that moment, Thomas thought he could make out the figure of an engine rolling through the station. It stopped on the points to the shed. It then moved again slowly and slowly rolling towards Thomas. Six small wheels, a short stumpy boiler, a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy dome, 
and a rusted, dirtied scratch number one on its sides. The shell stood in front of Thomas. The lack of a smokebox door only made Thomas feel even more afraid. A large piece from its tank fell onto the track. The shell then charged towards Thomas, shoving him through the shed and onto the main line. Thomas shrieked and screamed for help. They raced down the main line, through stations and over bridges. They eventually came to Gordon's Hill without stopping. Thomas didn't dare look at the shell directly, but could have sworn that a face was trying to form on it. They raced through the station at the bottom of the hill. Suddenly, Thomas felt a jolt, and then, without knowing, Thomas burst through the buffers and came off the tracks. He laid there, dazed and confused. Thomas began to black out, but the last thing he saw was the sight of a large rusty engine puffing next to his former shell. Thomas? Thomas? Thomas woke up. Gordon and the fat controller were there along with the breakdown crane. Both were frantic. Thomas? What happened? asked the fat controller. Some... something... Atta attacked me, sir. Thomas replied nervously. Well, what was it? No one attacked my engines! boomed the fat controller. Thomas didn't speak. He only looked at Gordon, who looked heartbroken to see his friend in this state. Tears began to stream down Thomas's face. The shells, he muttered quietly. Gordon looked at Thomas, horrified. He didn't want to believe what he heard, but he knew then and there what had happened. Just then, Edward arrived. He looked concerned. Sir, he called, there's something you need to see. The three engines puffed down the main line and back to the junction. When they arrived, they saw what awaited them. There was a part of a side tank which laid on the line. Over what was once a battered visible number one, it read, Meet us at the old mine. Meet us. The three engines stared at the sign and then at each other. It was Thomas's shell that chased him, sir, said Gordon. But that's impossible, protested the fat controller. Last I checked, they were trapped in the mines. How did this happen? I think I know how, said Edward slowly. Thomas and Gordon were shocked and looked at Edward. You know about this, Edward, replied Gordon hastily. Who do you think arrived to retrieve your... your faces? replied Edward. The two engines stared at Edward, and so did the fat controller. When I arrived, the fat controller told me to never speak of this incident to anyone. The others had some questions, especially why you both look different when you came back to the yard, but we told them that you had both been rebuilt following your mishaps. The Queen's arrival couldn't have come at any better time. We both thought that this would help you both ease into your normal lives again. We thought we could erase what had happened from the mines from history, but... He paused. We never accounted for the possibility of you both remembering, or not remembering, the incident at the mines. In hindsight, we didn't know what to do if you ever found out what happened, and when the Fat Controller knew about what you two were doing, well... You now know the rest. But the shells were in the ground. Now they're out on the rails. When I arrived to collect the vans that stored your faces, I looked into the chasm. For a second, I thought I could see your faces on your former shells. It was horrific, to say the least. But while I was leaving, I thought I could hear voices to come back, to save them, to not leave them to rust. I thought it was all in my mind. But now that this has happened, well, I think when we removed your faces, a part of your souls were released. And now it's come back to reclaim what they believe is rightfully theirs. The shed was silent. Gordon didn't know what to think. At last, Thomas spoke. Well, there's only one way to find out. Gordon looked at Thomas. He knew what he meant. If you are right, little Thomas, we should leave now. I can come with you both, interjected Edward, and so can I, replied the fat controller. Edward, sir, you could get hurt, and, Gordon said, these spirits don't want anything to do with you. It's us they want, 
Your interfering could prevent us from resolving whatever problems they have. I'm sorry, but it's best that only Thomas and I go. Edward and the Fat Controller looked at the two engines sadly. They knew Gordon was right. Be careful, you two, Edward said sadly, and good luck. The two engines smiled. See you two on the other side, said Thomas determined. The two engines then set off once again towards the old lead mines. The light of the stars reflected on the cool waters of the sea as the two engines puffed down the line. It was truly a beautiful sight. Well, at least they picked a pretty night, joked Thomas. Gordon chuckled. The two engines were dreadfully nervous, however. They soon arrived at the entrance of the mines. They slowed down to a halt. They were both horrified at what they saw. The once dilapidated giant chasm was now gone, but that wasn't what horrified them. On the track next to it were the former rusted shells of Thomas and Gordon. But instead of being greeted with smoke boxes with no doors, the shells now had horrifying faces. They were coated in rust, scars and holes protruding from their faces. Their eyes had sunken back towards their smoke boxes. The two engines scowled angrily at Thomas and Gordon. Thomas was nervous, but Gordon plucked up courage. What do you both want? he yelled. You got our attention. Now what do you want with us? You want us gone? Scrapped? Well, I'm sorry to say, but that's not going to happen. And if you dare hurt Thomas, I'll run you both off the rails and cause a sinkhole to swallow you both for good. The shell's expressions didn't move a muscle. Their eyes instead looked past Thomas. Thomas looked and saw what they were looking at. The danger sign that sat next to Thomas had a message. It read, To prove your worth of living, you must pass this test. Failure to do so results in fate worse than scrap. Thomas and Gordon looked at each other confused. Then all of a sudden, without explanation, Thomas began to move. His crew were thrown out of his cab. Thomas was horrified. Oh no, Gordon, help me! Thomas! Gordon tried to move forwards, but he couldn't. His wheels spun, but he felt like something was holding him back. Thomas's crew couldn't move as well. Gordon looked at the shells. What are you doing? He yelled. The shells didn't say anything. Thomas rolled forward. Then he felt the ground move. Oh no, not again! He shrieked. Thomas! cried Gordon. The ground began to open. Thomas had his eyes shut. He felt his wheels leaving the ground, only to instantly land on something. He opened his eyes and found out that he wasn't as deep as he feared. Thomas! shouted Gordon. Are you all right? I'm fine, called Thomas. Gordon then looked at the shells. Their eyes, once fixed on him, were now looking past him. Gordon followed their eyes to the sign again. The message had changed. But that wasn't all. To rescue your family, use this tool to, to save him, family, or save yourself and leave to him to rust. Gordon stared at the sign. He saw what lay next to it, the winch. He looked at the shells and then behind him. He then looked at Thomas. He instantly made up his mind. Driver, fireman, the winch, fasten it to me. The crew did just that. Once the winch was secured, Gordon finally moved, slowly and carefully. He dropped sand to get a good grip on the rails. Soon he was close enough. His crew and Thomas's crew fastened the winch and the strong cables to the two engines. Then Thomas's crew climbed into Thomas's cab. Suddenly, the ground began to open a little. Thomas began to move forward into the earth. The opening quickly ceased. Gordon, I'm scared. I'm sorry for all of this. This was my fault. I got us all into this mess. Thomas, you had no idea what you were getting yourself into, said Gordon. And no matter what happens, I'll always be by your side. I will never let anything happen to you, little brother. The ground began to rumble slightly. We're out of time, said Thomas's driver. Are you ready? Yes, said Gordon's crew. Heave! Gordon heaved with all of his might. His wheels thankfully didn't lose control and began to get a grip on the rails, but it was hard work. Just then, the ground began to shake. The hole started to widen. Thomas, I need your help, cried Gordon. Thomas's crew threw on the throttle wide backwards. Thomas's wheels spun and spun. 
desperately trying to get a grip on the rails, but his wheels weren't on the rails. The dirt and stocks were blocking Thomas's wheels from reaching the rails. Then Gordon started to move forward. He braked with all of his might. On my countdown, grunted Gordon. Give it your all, he shouted. One, two, three. And with a mighty heave, Gordon pulled Thomas free from the dirt and stones. Thomas's wheels managed to get a grip and the two engines shot backwards just as the mine gave away. The rails buckled and collapsed. Dirt, stones and ballast sunk below into the growing chasm. The two engines stopped at a safe distance and stared at where they once stood. They then looked to their left and saw their shells. This time, instead of the scowling, rusty engines that greeted them, what greeted them was themselves in their former glory. The two engines smiled at Thomas and Gordon. Thank you, you freed us, said the former Thomas. You're welcome, replied Thomas. However, continued the former Gordon, there is something more you two should know. There is some and what's that? asked Gordon. The others, said the former Thomas. They still need to know the truth, and they will they still need to when know the, the time truth, is and right. They will. They still the two engines then vanished. In their place were the old rusty shells, but this time no faces could be seen, only where smoke box doors should have been. I think it's time we should take these to the scrapyard to be melted down, said Gordon quietly. Thomas could only agree, and that's what they did. The two engines didn't leave the scrapyard until their former shells melted down completely. It was the evening before Halloween, so because of this, the engines were at Tidmouth Shed preparing to tell ghost stories. It was an annual tradition the engines of the Northwestern Railway had been doing since the railway's beginning. A firelighter arrived to light a campfire-like fire, and soon the sheds were covered in a warm orange glow, which was the atmosphere the engines wanted. After the firelighter left, the engines began to tell ghost stories. Some tried to outdo others, but failed miserably. Despite that, the engines still had fun. Eventually, it was Thomas's turn to tell a story. Thomas had been thinking of stories to tell for this night, but only one had come to mind, and it was a story that Gordon had helped him with. And this story was a story the two engines were not eager to tell in the slightest. Despite that, they were still keen to stick to tradition. Thomas looked at Gordon, who gave him an encouraging smile. It will be all right, he said sympathetically. You won't be telling it fully. I'll cover the second part of it for you. Thanks, Gordon, smiled Thomas bravely. That's nice to hear. And you know what they say, some risks are risks worth taking. Exactly, smiled Gordon encouragingly. Thomas plucked up all of his courage before addressing the other engines. All right, everyone, he said in the boldest tone he could muster. Here is the story that me and Gordon came up with. Because Gordon helped me with this story, he'll cover part of it. I'll start the story off. And so, Thomas began. A long time ago, somewhere in England, there was a railway. This railway was very similar to ours, as it not only had a main line and a couple of branch lines, but it also had engines of all the types you can think of, both big and small. Thomas paused impressively. However, he continued, there was one location that the railway was most infamous for. One of the tracks next to the terminus at one of the ends of the line led to a lead mine. The ground was very weak at a certain section, to the point that it could only support trucks and not engines. Because of this, a sign was placed just before that section to warn engines to not go there. Unfortunately, there was a tank engine that thought he knew better. This tank engine was very gullible and didn't understand the danger, and I'm sorry to say that this naive trait would become the tank engine's downfall. The other engines looked wide-eyed at Thomas. The tank engine had tried several times to sneak past the danger sign, 
but his crew would always stop him. But one day, the tank engine made a plan. He had taken some trucks to the lead mine as usual, and as usual, stopped just before the set of points where the danger sign was. I think I can guess what happened next, said Toby, but keep going, Thomas. Thank you, Toby, replied Thomas. Just as the fireman was about to change the points, the tank engine suddenly jerked forward, knocking his driver off the footplate. When he regained his bearings, the driver called out to his engine, trying to warn him that he had made a big mistake. Unfortunately, his cries fell on deaf ears. The tank engine continued to laugh, thinking he was being very clever. However, he wasn't being clever at all. Just as the fireman had helped the driver to his feet, the ground under the tank engine started to rumble and the rails quivered as a result. The tank engine, realising his mistake, tried to reverse, but by then it was already too late. The ballast slipped away as the rails sagged and broke as the mine collapsed beneath the tank engine, swallowing him whole. The other engines gasped in horror before going deathly silent. Their eyes were now officially glued to Thomas. They were all too shocked by the story to make a sound. Now, the sheds were as silent as a tomb, with only the sounds of crickets and an owl breaking said silence. However, those sounds were the least of the engine's worries. This story was certainly going to give them nightmares for days. Thomas then looked at Gordon, giving him the signal that it was now his time to finish the story. The other engines, seeing that, also turned their attention to Gordon. Gordon took a deep breath before continuing where Thomas had left off. When the controller heard about the accident, he immediately rushed to the scene. It was decided by him and the workmen that the ground was too weak for a crane, so, an alternative option was found. The controller brought his biggest and strongest engine to the mine to try and pull the tank engine out with a tow cable. As soon as the big engine arrived at the mine, the winch was hooked up to the back of the tank engine. As soon as the controller gave the order, the big engine began to heave. The big engine heaved as hard as he could, determined to pull the tank engine to safety. Unfortunately, the workman and the controller had all misjudged how weak the ground was, as well as how hollow the shaft was below. The big engine's weight started to become too much for the ground to handle, so as a result, it began to collapse beneath the big engine. So, because of this, the big engine also fell into the growing chasm below. To make matters worse, the extra collapsed ground caused some trucks to roll backwards into the mine, crashing into the two engines, setting them on fire in the process. The fire brigade was called, but by the time the fire was out, it was already too little too late. The two engines were mangled and beyond repair as a result. So, the controller had no choice but to scrap the two engines. The other engines gasped again before going completely silent once more. Never disobey a danger sign, said Thomas grimly, or you might end up like those two engines, continued Gordon gloomily. That, that is the moral, is the moral of the story of the, of the, story engines, of the that engines died in the, that mine. Died in the mine, Thomas and Gordon finished together. The other engines were silent for a moment before Henry spoke up. Well, you two, he said boldly, that moral was excellent considering what happened. That tank engine must have been a complete jock. Henry, snapped Thomas. Just because that tank engine didn't know he shouldn't disobey a danger sign doesn't mean he was outright bad. How do you know that? sneered Henry. Thomas's expression changed to a nervous one, as if he was hiding something. He began to stutter. Well... Um, you see, uh, answer my question, roared Henry. But before Thomas could come up with an answer, a sound cut him off. The other engines heard it too. Said sound was very faint at first, but it then grew louder. Then it became clear to the engines what the sound was. It was the sound of two engines, one big and one small, puffing. Puffing. 
Just then, two shadowy shapes began to be made out in the distance, coming closer and closer to the sheds. As the two figures came closer, the engines realised that these two shadows resembled the shapes of engines, one a tank engine, and the other a tender engine. The two engines began to slow down before stopping on the turntable. The turntable began to move on its own before stopping when pointing at Thomas. Who are you two? asked Henry crossly. A board then appeared in front of the tank engines before words appeared on said board. Thomas read the message the board had. We are the engines that died in the mine, he read nervously. The others were surprised. They definitely hadn't expected the engines from the story to actually be real, never mind show up here. Henry then spoke to the two mysterious visitors again. Well, what are you two doing here? This isn't your railway, you know. Right after Henry said that, the message on the board changed. Thomas read the new message that was now on the board. This is our railway. You've all been lied to. Thomas began to stutter as he realised what these two ghosts were trying to say. It d didn't happen on a foot... Far away r railway, it, it happened here. Thomas then looked up at the two uninvited guests as a realisation dawned on him and Gordon. Are you two who we think you are? asked Thomas nervously. Once again, the message on the board changed. This time, Gordon read it. We sure are. Gordon then looked up to the two shadowy engines. Looks like the time for the truth to be revealed has come now, hasn't it? On cue, the two engines reveal to everyone their true forms. The other engines' eyes widened when they saw exactly who those two engines were. Said two engines looked like Thomas and Gordon. No, stammered Henry. It can't be! That's Thomas and Gordon in their original shapes, exclaimed James. But how? cried Percy. What's going on? bellowed a voice. The engines looked to see the fat controller standing next to his car with a light in his hand. Sir, said Toby nervously as he looked back at the Thomas and Gordon on the turntable. The fat controller looked there too and gasped. Former Thomas and Gordon, he exclaimed in shock. How are you two here? It's a long story, answered the other Thomas. But, continued the other Gordon, it's best we let our current selves explain it's all that. Best we let our Thomas and Gordon knew their former selves were right. Everyone, began Thomas as he rallied all the courage he could, about that story me and Gordon told. It didn't happen on a faraway railway. It did indeed happen here. And those two engines, continued Gordon, were me and Thomas. The other engines were horrified. But, but, stuttered Henry, that's impossible. There was no mine incident, protested James. All that happened was that Thomas fell into a mine and you rescued him, Gordon. End of story. I'm sorry, replied Edward, but we lied to you. There was a mine incident. Indeed, added Thomas. He then proceeded to begin telling the truth to everyone of what really happened at the old lead mines. When I fell into the mine, Thomas began sadly, I didn't just fall. The mine collapsed beneath me completely, swallowing me whole. They tried to get me to lift Thomas out with a pulling system, continued Gordon, but there was a miscalculation of how hollow the shaft was below and how weak the ground was below. So, because of that, I also fell into the growing chasm beneath the ground. But, stammered Percy, how are you two here if you're over there? It's a tragic tale, sighed the fat controller sadly. Due to our poor judgement, there was a big scandal. So to save face, we... We... They took off their faces, 
finished Deadwood. There was a talented engineer from Crewe that moved Thomas and Gordon's faces to new shells. I know this because I came to retrieve their faces of the mine when said faces were taken off. When Edward arrived, the Fat Controller continued, we both vowed to never tell anyone about this incident. That was why we all told you that Thomas and Gordon were rebuilt following their mishaps. Thankfully, that was when the Queen came to visit our railway. We hoped that this would ease Thomas and Gordon back into normal lives and erase what happened at the mines from history. But sadly, we were wrong. Shortly after the Queen's visit, continued Thomas, me and Gordon both started having nightmares about the mine. We talked to each other about those nightmares, and that was when we realised that we didn't remember the mine incident. So, continued Gordon, we decided to investigate, and when we did, we found our former selves inside the pit. I was there waiting for them, continued the Fat Controller, and I told them everything. But shortly after that, continued Thomas, somehow our former selves got out of the pit and my former self chased me. Thankfully, Edward has a theory on how. Indeed I do, replied Edward grimly. While Thomas and Gordon's faces were being loaded into the van I took said faces in, I looked into the chasm, and for a second, I thought I saw faces on their former shells. It was so horrifying, I could barely stomach it. To add insult to injury, as I was leaving, I thought I heard Thomas and Gordon calling out to me, telling me to come back, to save them, to not leave them to rust. However, I shrugged it off, thinking it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But now, I realise that wasn't the case. Edward looked at the former Thomas and Gordon before saying, You two Willie were calling out to me, weren't you? Yes, Edward, answered the former Thomas. We were. When they removed our faces, explained the former Gordon, a part of our souls were released, and we had come back to reclaim what we believed was rightfully ours. Once all that was worked out, continued Thomas, Gordon and I decided to resolve things with our former selves once and for all. We arrived at the mines to find the once dilapidated giant chasm gone. On the track next to it were the former rusted shells of our former selves. Their faces were horrifying, but I'd rather not go into the details of that for their sake. They were scowling angrily at us, continued Gordon. Then they made the danger sign's message change. It said that to prove our worth of living, we had to pass a test, and before we could say anything, the test begun. Our former selves threw my crew off my footplate, continued Thomas, and made me roll towards the weak point of the ground. They also held Gordon back. As I rolled forward, I felt the ground move before it opened. Luckily, the shaft wasn't as deep as I feared. It was only then our former selves released their grip on me, continued Gordon, and gave me a winch to pull Thomas to safety. Luckily, in the end, I was able to do what my former self had failed to do, rescue Thomas, and that was when me and Thomas passed the test. After all that, continued Thomas, we went back to where our former selves were, but this time what greeted us was them in their former glory as you see here right now. They thanked us and told us that we had freed them, continued Gordon, before their faces disappeared and the shells changed into rusty shells with no faces at all. We took said shells to the scrapyard and didn't leave until the shells were completely melted down, he finished solemnly. But there's one part of dead engines you can't but get rid of, replied the former Thomas. They're spirits. And we're no exception, added the former Gordon. And that's how we're here now. The truth and that's how has now shown now. itself. The, truth. the other engines began to cry after hearing all this. That doesn't change who they are today, said the former Thomas. They are still really useful engines to this very day. Really Indeed, concurred the former Gordon. There were pure intentions here to give a second chance to us, here, and that was what seemingly happened. Plus, they avoided a scandal in the process. Yeah, replied Thomas. 
Even though we are not the originals, we are still Thomas the Tank Engine and Gordon the Big Engine, and that's all that matters, finished Gordon. The other engines felt better after hearing that. The former Thomas and Gordon smiled before puffing away, buffer to buffer, and disappearing. A train spotter had been out by himself that night and had recorded everything that transpired at Tidmouth Sheds. The Fat Controller caught him but had no hard feelings. The truth about what really happened at the old lead mines made the front page of lots of newspapers a couple of days later. Everyone was rendered speechless. Despite this, there was a huge outpouring of support for Thomas and Gordon, which the two engines were extremely grateful for. Thanks to all this support, Thomas and Gordon were finally able to completely heal and go back to being really useful engines once again.